I want you to take notice of a word found in verse number one and in verse number five. In verse number one, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is, notice this word, forgiven. And then the Bible tells us in verse number five, it says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Now notice these words, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. I want you to notice the word forgiven and the word forgavest. Throughout fundamentalism, we major in all sorts of doctrines. We major in justification by faith and faith alone. We major specifically, I mean, you have, have been associated with the Independent Baptist Church long enough to, to understand that many preachers stand up and they preach the paint off the walls with hell, fire, and damnation. I mean, you walk into the services and it's as if you can smell the fire burning down under. But there's something that we do not major on as often as we should in fundamentalism. And it's this word called forgiveness. This evening, I would like to label my thoughts with this simple phrase. God is a forgiving God. God is a forgiving God. Aren't you thankful this evening that God is able to forgive us of our sins? Perhaps as we come to, to zone in on this text, this passage of Scripture, just perhaps that if God is a forgiving God, then His people ought to be forgiving people. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm glad there was a day when I got down on my knees and I said, God, please forgive me of my sin and create in me a clean heart. Matthew chapter 6, that great Sermon on the Mount that we study and we, we exalt because Jesus Christ is speaking, but, but He says these words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. In fact, it's the Lord's Prayer that many of you have memorized. And it says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And he continues by saying these words. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Sobering words from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not my words I want you to notice this evening. That's the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, the Bible says that, that Peter came up to the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? <laughs> so, so Peter comes up to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, Lord, each time my brother comes up and offends me and does something wrong to me, do I forgive them? And how many times do I forgive them? Seven times? You remember what Jesus said? Seven times 70. That's exactly right. He looks at him and said, I say unto thee, it says, excuse me, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So, so you mean to tell me, Brother Brian, that I just get out the figure 70 and multiply that by number seven, and that's how many times I'm supposed to forgive my brother? No, no, my friends. That's not what it means. The Lord Jesus Christ is implying here that, that we are to continually forgive others, because if we do not, then our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. This evening, by means of introduction, I have a key statement that I like to read to you, and it's based from verses 1 and 2. 
Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, but cursed is the man whose transgression is not forgiven. You see, in our movement today, yes, we stand up here and we preach hell with a capital H, a capital E, a capital L, and a capital L. I mean, the Bible declares it, therefore, we ought to proclaim it with grace and mercy and long-suffering, as He's called us to do. But let me say this this evening, that when we reject the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, that's when we will be damned and condemned for all eternity in a terrible place the Bible has described as hell. Today, as we come to our passage this evening, the subscription underneath Psalm 32 tells us this is a psalm of David, a man after God's own heart. The background of this psalm, we do not exactly know what went on in the life of David. Some commentators have supposed that, that as we read verses 1 through 5, which, which is totally different from verses 6 through 11, that when we zone in verses 1 through 5, that, that David could be recalling his great sin with Bathsheba, as he was in Psalm 51. Whether that is the case or not, I cannot tell you for certain. But this evening, I would like to answer, answer a very simple question. What do Christians do when they sin? I mean, what do we do when we sin? Do we just continue in that sin? Is it something that we, we just, we say, God, I'm sorry, and we move on? What exactly do we do when we sin? Do we overlook it? Do we just move on in life as if it never happened? Well, this evening, I want to zone in in verse 5, and I want to give you three statements about what Christians are to do when we sin. Notice verse 5 of 32, it says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. Notice also verse number 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When I read these two statements in Psalm 32, I wrote down this. When Christians sin... Never attempt to hide it from God. When Christians sin, never attempt to hide it from God. As many of you know, I grew up riding a piece of wood with four wheels on it called a skateboard. I enjoyed that season of my life, riding here and riding there. If it wasn't for Boonsville Baptist Church and the youth there, some of those teenagers, I would have never been introduced to skateboarding. They introduced it to me and it just went from there. But anyways, when it was raining outside and when I was unable to go to the skate park with my friends, when my dad just said, no, Brian, you're not going. And that's final. <laughs> there was no way to talking him into it if he didn't want me to go. So I just had to accept it. So I began to get acquainted with the basement of our house. And I enjoyed riding my skateboard down there. And I was not any good at this time. And and uh, I, I was just practicing different tricks and all sorts of times I would come home from school, practice my tricks down there, go back upstairs about my daily life. But I remember one occasion, there I am, just kind of new into skateboarding, so I'm still doing the falling stuff. Now, you fall all the time while you're riding a skateboard, but especially when you're just getting acquainted with the balance on the piece of wood and four wheels. So there I am in my basement, and something happens, and I shoot out, and I fall down to the ground, and I, in slow motion, I kid you not, as I replay this in my mind, my skateboard is rapidly, but in my mind, slowly going to the wall. And if you know anything about a lot of basements, some of them have cement walls like we have here, and then in some areas, you have what's called drywall. And if you don't know this, um, I just want to give you a lesson. Drywall is not a cement wall like this over here. Okay, if you hit it, it's going to have a little hole. So my skateboard plows right into the wall and leaves a giant hole about like this from the skateboard. And in my mind, I mean, I start sweating. I know because I'm going to get killed by my father because I poked a hole in the wall. So I got an idea, just a crazy idea. 
You get some of these ideas as a, as a teenager. I picked up all the pillows downstairs on the couch and put them all over the walls to make it look like I was protecting the walls downstairs. So my aunt finds out about this, and then she told my mom. And then my mom tells my dad. And my dad walks down there and pulls that pillow off the wall, and lo and behold, he found the hole. And that was one of many holes that would come throughout the experience of me skateboarding in the basement. But I said that to say this, that just as I was attempting to cover up the hole in the wall from my parents, we are so guilty of that with our relationship with Almighty God. Far too many times in my own life and most likely in your life, we get the pillows and we cover up the areas of our life. We try to do everything within our power to cover it up so nobody else knows about it. But we cannot hide it from Almighty God. Proverbs 28 and verse 13, a great verse of wisdom for us says this, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Somebody once said, if you cover up your sin, God will uncover it. But if you uncover your sin, God will cover it. How does he cover up our sin? Well, as a Christian, when we trust Christ as Savior, he covers up our sin with his own personal blood. And I'm thankful that our sins can be washed white as snow. In Joshua chapter 7, we read the story of, of, of Moses and the children of Israel, and it transitions from Moses being the leader to a, to a man named Joshua. And he comes on the scene and he leads his, his people. But a man by the name of Achan attempted to hide something from God and his people. And you remember what happened? It was found, and he paid the consequences of it. In Acts chapter 5, a lot of people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. To the contrary, church, the God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. The, the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. But anyways, as we look in the book of Acts, people will say, oh, well, why did God smite people dead in the Old Testament, but he didn't do so in the New Testament? Well, if you read Acts chapter 5, you'll find out that Ananias and Sapphira, they, they held back a portion of what they were supposed to give to God. They hid their sin from God and everybody. And then the Holy Ghost laid upon Peter and he said, why did you do this? And sin against the Holy Spirit. So listen, when we sin, don't hide it from God. Far too many Christians, and by the way, what I'm about to say is going to hit us all right in the forehead. Because at some point in our life, we are guilty at, at committing something on this, this paragraph that I'm about to read. Too many Christians are trying to hide their sin of lust, sexual immorality, pornography, homosexuality, hatred, lying, gossip, envy, strife, filthy communication, immodesty, unholiness, idolatry, ungodly music, alcohol, drugs, an ungodly lifestyle, unforgiveness, bitterness, covetousness, traditionalism, lukewarm Christianity, backsliding, rebellion, greediness, loving money rather than loving God, skipping um, uh, meetings of the local assembly, not spending time in the Word of God, not fellowshipping with God in prayer, spending time with individuals that we should not be spending time with. Listen, church. Let's stop trying to hide our sin from God. Every one of us in our lives, at some point, tries to hide sin from God. So when we sin, never attempt to hide it from God. Remember what David did? David committed sin against Bathsheba and he murdered uh, her husband. And in the process, he attempted to cover it up, but, but the prophet comes and he says, Thou art the man, and it was uncovered. And David goes and he writes Psalm 51, pleading to God for forgiveness, which we will speak of in just moments ahead. 
Psalm 32, verse 5 says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. So this evening, what do we do when we sin? Well, when Christians sin, never attempt to hide it from God. May I give you the second statement this evening? When Christians sin, specifically confess it to God. When Christians sin, specifically confess it to God. Notice what verse 5 goes on to say. David writes and he says, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Verse uh, part of verse, the first part of verse 5 says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. And then if you connect acknowledge in the word confess, they are, they are used in a sense interchangeably here in this passage, just, just delivering a meaning that, that, hey, God, I've sinned against you, and I'm confessing it. Psalm 51 tells us about the prophet Nathan coming to to David, and, and he tells a story about, about an individual who did not use consistency with these lambs. And he said, oh, a thief he is. And the prophet looked to David and said, thou art the man. And David goes to his closet of prayer, and he says, have mercy upon me, O God, According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God." and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips." And my mouth shall so show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are, broke, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Psalm 51 is just David's prayer to God of confession once he sinned against the Lord. He acknowledged and confessed his sin specifically to God. I'm encouraged from the fact that Proverbs 24, 16 tells us that when a just man falls, he falls seven times, but he rises up again. So in life, we, we hear it all the time of how ministers and, and godly people have sinned against God drastically, and they've fallen. But I, I am here today to let you know that no matter what our position is in a local assembly, no matter what our position is in our society or country, when we sin against God, it may limit our service to Him in the future, but God is never done with us as long as we confess it to Him. Unconfessed sin will rob us of our rewards on the judgment day as we stand before Jesus Christ. So when Christians sin, never attempt to hide it from God. When Christians sin, specifically confess it to God. But now let me share with you a third statement about what we are to do when we sin as a Christian. Verse 5, 
David said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And notice these next powerful and wonderful words. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. This word Selah, all it means is to pause and reflect upon what was just read. It occurs in verse number four, verse number five, and verse number seven. But notice verse five is all by itself because it's packed with such power. When we acknowledge our sin to God and confess it and we don't hide it, then God will forgive us. So here's this, the third statement I wrote down. When Christians confess their sin, they receive the forgiveness of God. When Christians confess their sin, they receive the forgiveness of God. Did you hear about that young man? That young man was traveling in his home country. He was going from place to place and he was traveling and his mother recommended that he go and attend this specific church service on the Lord's day so he could worship the Lord and then see how they worshiped. This young man knew the scriptures and was reared in the scriptures, but has not made the decision to trust Christ as Savior yet. And this young man goes, and, and during the day that he's supposed to go to this church that his, that his family recommended him to go to, a humongous snowstorm hits his area in which he lived. And it deterred him from going to that service. So as he's, as he's traveling, he, he makes a turn down on a street and he goes and he, and he sees a little sign and it says a primitive Methodist church. And he goes to that church and he walks into the doors and he, as he recalls the story of this young man, he says only about 10 to 15 people were present. In fact, as he sat in the service, he said the pastor wasn't even able to be there because he was snowed in. And one of the men of the church apparently stood up there to, to speak. And in his own words, he says that this man, as he read through the passage of Scripture, he fumbled upon the words. When he spoke, he was not clear. And he was not a good speaker at all. But during that sermon, which only lasted no more than 15 minutes, this young man sat in the auditorium. And the individual speaking was speaking from Isaiah chapter 45. And he read his text from verse 22. And he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. During that sermon, the man filling in on behalf of the pastor looked, did square in the eyes of that young man, that young 15-year-old man, and said, Young man, you look very miserable. And you will always be miserable. Miserable is life, in life, excuse me, miserable in death. If you don't obey my text, but if you obey now, this moment you will be saved. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and live. At that moment, during that service, a service that this young man was not even planning on being in, in, in the service of. Who, a snowstorm came, and I submit to you, the snowstorm was a sovereignty of Almighty God. That young man goes to, yes, a, meth, a primitive Methodist church who were known for singing extremely loud. And I believe that God can use anybody from any denomination to accomplish His will on this earth. And that evening, a great soldier of our faith came to know Jesus Christ as Savior by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. There he confessed his sin to God at 15 years of age. And then we are told, just a year later, he goes to pass through a young, uh, excuse me, a small country church in the middle of the country. And then three years down the road, he summoned by the respected Metropolitan Tabernacle to come there and become their pastor at the age of 19. I said all that to say this, that, that Charles Spurgeon that day, he confessed his sin to God 
and God forgave him of his sin. And I know that at that time he was a sinner lost and hell bound, but he became a saint. And now as we are saints this evening, when we sin, we are to do the same thing. God, forgive me of the things I've said. God, forgive me of the things I've done. This evening, I solemnly submit to you, God is a forgiving God. When Christians sin, never attempt to hide it from God. When Christians sin, specifically confess it to God. When Christians confess their sin, they receive the forgiveness of God. If God forgave us, we also ought to forgive one another. God is a forgiving God. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for this text, God, that's so rich in the life of David. And Father, we thank you that even though David was mightily used by your hand, that he's just like us, human and full of sin. And Father, we thank you that you're able to cleanse our sin with the blood of Christ. And Lord, if there be an individual within our midst this evening that has never received the cleansing of sin, God, I pray that today would be that day. Father, we thank you for the service this evening. God, we thank you for Brother Blake as he presented his ministry. And now, Father, we pray that you would just set a hedge of protection about him, provide all the necessities, his financial necessities, God, his spiritual necessities, everything that he needs, Father. We pray you'd provide for him and the team going to Nepal. Lord, we pray for, for our safety as we leave and part our ways this evening. We ask that you'd set a hedge of protection about us as we travel down the roads. Keep us safe. And Father, bring us back at the next appointed time. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.